Okay, so our fourth, it's more of a story than a case study, um, involves Maud, not her real name. She was an actual patient of mine um, in labor and delivery. <clears throat> it's really a story about mosaicism. It's also a story about professional role development and why genomics is important uh, to understand in practice and why it will be increasingly more important in the future. So Maud is a 39 year old woman who emigrated from Haiti six months ago. She is in labor with her second baby. Her first child was like 14 years old. So, you know, getting her into labor, she was an induction patient. Um, she's about five centimeters. Anyway, Maud had limited English proficiency and she required an interpreter for Haitian Creole. And even though we have a lot of Spanish speaking people on the floor, um, we have nobody who speaks Haitian Creole and the interpreter is sometimes um, harder to find even through the language line. During her prenatal care, um, the clinic offered non-invasive non prenatal testing um, or otherwise known as NIPS or NIPT. And it revealed that there were some fetal cells with trisomy 16. So non-invasive prenatal testing is a sample of mom's blood um, that is examined for traces of either cell-free DNA, which would indicate that the fetal cells kind of disintegrated as they were migrating, or sometimes you'll see fetal cells. Um, in this case, they saw something associated with trisomy 16. She went under amniocentesis and it revealed a mosaic pattern. So some of the cells were karyotyped for 46XY and some of them had 47XY, an extra copy of chromosome 16. So to give you some sort of foundational knowledge in that, we know what mosaicism is. I've talked about it before. Um, so if you don't know, go back to that video because this is going to matter. Trisomy 16, if it's complete, is lethal. We don't have anybody who has a complete trisomy 16 walking around or even living for a few hours. If every cell in your body codes for trisomy 16, embryonic life fails to develop. Okay? So we have this mosaic trisomy. We do not know how many cells or which ones are affected, just that we've isolated two different karyotypes. Maud also has gestational diabetes managed with insulin and chronic hypertension. So she's a high risk patient on a lot of levels. She's got limited English proficiency. Um, she was an induction of labor for the gestational diabetes at 39 weeks. So her pregnancy progressed all that time. Now to give you a little more background information, Maud had been consistent with prenatal care. She was adherent to her treatment for gestational diabetes. Um, she took labetalol for her blood pressure, which is a beta blocker. It's considered safe in pregnancy. She went to every visit, went to every maternal fetal appointment, was very adherent to care, highly motivated. Okay. So you're a nurse in labor and delivery and you've been assigned to her care because that's what I was. I actually had two patients that day. Um, so report was kind of rushed, but there was a note in the chart by the perinatologist who is um, highly interested in genetic testing and its potential um, to revolutionize maternity care. The note documented that the significance of the finding was explained to the patient using a certified Haitian Creole interpreter and that she verbalized understanding. The significance of the finding, by the way, had not been explained to any of the staff that day. Um, so we didn't really know what we were dealing with. The note documents that she declined termination of the pregnancy stating it is in God's hands. No documentation that teach back method was used or anything as far as like an advanced directive for this kid or a birth plan. <clears throat> and there's documentation that there were second and third trimester, trimester ultrasounds done, but the reports were not available in the patient's chart. Don't know what happened there. Usually somebody has to sign them for them to appear 
where you can view them. Um, so we didn't know if they found something on ultrasound and I asked in report, and nobody could answer that question for me. I looked on the high risk list and she was on it for mosaic trisomy 16, but there was no notation of whether this child had any observable anomalies. We knew it was mosaic. We knew it affected some cells. We didn't know how many, we didn't know which ones, and we didn't know what the actual consequences were going to be. So the significance of the finding may or may not have been adequately explained to the patient. I just know they weren't really passed on to the rest of us. And we weren't genomics certified nurses. We're in labor and delivery. We get babies out of mothers. That's what we do. We try to do it safely and as quickly as possible and relieve pain. That's kind of our scope. So let's imagine you're me. And while you're caring for Maud, the external fetal monitor reveals a prolonged deceleration of the fetal heart rate with a nadir or a low point of 50 beats per minute. And if you need a refresher of um, OB for this, I don't think you have to go all the way back to your content or your textbook. I am going to tell you that the strip was ugly. I was in the other patient's room I just finished doing an epidural with that patient, but I had a computer screen that I could kind of split screen and see both strips at the same time. I saw it, kind of made a choice that this patient was more stable. Her blood pressures after the epidural were okay. I ran out of that room and into Maud's room. Maud is not her real name, by the way. I don't think it's anybody's real name anymore. It's just too old fashioned, but whatever. We did all the intrauterine resuscitation efforts, flipped her onto her left side, started a fluid bullish. She was on a little bit of pit. She's five centimeters, so I shut off that. We don't give oxygen anymore. Baseline recovered, 200 beats a minute. Better than it was, but it's still fetal bradycardia. And there's this funky sound to it that's consistent with a fetal arrhythmia. It's like irregular, like a broken clock or a drummer that lost his rhythm. Um, fetal arrhythmias, by the way, are common enough. They're not, I wouldn't say they're common, they're, but they're not rare. They do happen, and most of them resolve at delivery when that baby changes from fetal circulation to newborn circulation. Arrhythmias by themselves don't bother me, but there's this whole unknown factor there's no ultrasound report. There's nothing to say she got an echo, which just based on her diabetic status alone should have been performed. Could there be some cardiac anomalies? I don't know trisomy 16 all that well, and I didn't have time to look it up. So this is why like a little bit of knowledge could be, you're, you're going to see why this is, why it's important to include genomics in our education curriculum. We start internal fetal monitoring. That's that little scalp electrode. You screw it into the baby's head so we can get a better read on the heartbeat. And we called, it was a midwife caring for the patient. She called the obstetrician. Obstetrician called the perinatologist briefly. Then she comes into the room and she proceeds to explain options for C-section versus vaginal using the Siricom interpreter line. Now this patient was about five centimeters, but she was what we call a Foley bulb five, which means we put in a Foley bulb, we inflated the balloon, and it kind of mechanically dilated the cervix. She wasn't in a great labor pattern yet. I had started Pitocin. We were still at a very low dose. She had a long way to go, and her baby, her first baby was 14 years ago. So getting people into labor sometimes takes time. She's remote from delivery. The baby was showing signs of stress. So kind of keep all these factors in your head. Now we have this other discussion that ensues. So the provider doesn't really understand the clinical significance and you can't blame her because that information wasn't available to us until this moment of crisis occurs. She calls the perinatologist and he has a very esoteric conversation with the provider about the odds of trisomy 16 being insignificant versus severe disability. And it doesn't seem like she's had time to really absorb this, but there is that note in the chart that says patient understands it all. 
She tells a patient that cesarean is better for the baby, but that the trisomy might mean that the baby dies anyway, so the outcome might not be different, and there are risks, and based on the fact that you're 40, you're at higher risk for all kinds of complications, including, and this just went on and on. Um, DVT and wound infection and um, postpartum preeclampsia. And then she asks the mother, we need to know what you want to do. The Haitian Creole operator at this point is like, can I have clarification? I don't know what any of these words mean. They just, you know, these, these folks, you know, in the interpreter lines, they have some medical terminology and maybe some medical background. But when we're discussing advanced concepts that aren't in ordinary um, bedside care, she had no idea how to translate this to the patient. And you kind of wonder whether the operator in the maternal fetal office, wherever they, whoever they got a hold of, maybe she didn't understand the terminology either. So the patient doesn't understand what the provider wants her to do. She came to us trusting that we would do the best we could. And whatever the outcome was, she was willing to accept it. At first, she replies to the provider that it is in God's hands and the provider is not satisfied with that. She keeps going and, and re-explaining the same thing in the same big words over and over again. Patient then becomes a little bit agitated. You can really see her just whatever you think is best. She didn't know how to make an informed decision about this. Um, so it's kind of a messy situation, right? So what's the simplest explanation of mosaicism? If you were trying to clarify this for the Haitian Creole operator, let's hope that it's not in this situation where, you know, time's ticking and we've got to get this baby out. I mean, I'm back to the question, the simplest explanation of mosaicism. Let's go through some options. Option one. Some cells in the body have the genotype for the disorder, while others have a normal genotype, meaning some cells have three chromosomes and some cells have two. That's option one. Option two is all individuals with mosaicism will show a similar pattern of disease. Option three. The phenotype of the individual will appear normal, although the affected gene is silenced in all cells. Option four, mosaicism is a pattern of incomplete dominance where the normal chromosome and the abnormal chromosomes cause a milder form of the disorder. Think about that for a second. Correct option is one. Mosaicism is a mistake that happens in some cells of the body. It happens in early embryonic development. So you start out maternal chromosome pattern is normal for a haploid cell. Paternal chromosome is normal for a haploid cell, for gametes. They each have one chromosome. They combine and give you 46 chromosomes. In this case, 46 XY. Somewhere in the line of embryonic development, one of those cells does an oops and makes three copies of a chromosome. That will affect any cells that originate from that cell. Any cells that didn't make that mistake are going to continue to develop with 46 chromosomes. So we'll have some cells and tissues with the anomaly and some without it. Sometimes we have involvement only in the cells that are not in the embryo. They're going to become a placenta. So extra embryonic cells might make this mistake. And now your placenta is affected, but the developing embryo is not affected. That is also a thing that can happen. So that's what mosaicism is. It does not look the same for everybody. There is wild variation. Sometimes the deviant cells, like I said, are confined to the placenta, sometimes only a few cells and we have mild involvement and sometimes many cells are affected. It depends on when and what type. Um, so there's not one genotype that is silenced. The number and type of cells affected will, will determine the phenotypic expression. 
dumb those words down when you're talking to somebody with a fourth grade education, um, or they're just going to look at you and not understand. They might say that they do um, because they want to appear that they're cooperating with you and that they understand you trying to be polite. Um, but they won't understand words like phenotype and genotype if they don't have a biology background. It is not related. Mosaicism is not related to incomplete dominance where you have the right number of alleles, but they mediate each other. It's an interaction between normal alleles. Okay. So some cells affected, some cells not. During the conversation with the interpreter, the fetal monitor continues to reveal fetal bradycardia and an arrhythmia. And I'm standing there. I'm holding the sequential compression stockings, the OR hats, the OR booties, a gown for dad so he can dress up to go back to the OR. I've got the clipper blade so I can do the little shave for the incision because everything about this strip, and I've got the volume sort of playing in the background, can't play it too loud because the interpreter won't be able to hear things. But it's giving me anxiety. This kid's trying to say, help me get me out of here. And in any other pregnancy, if we didn't know that there was this mosaic trisomy, we would have been in the OR like a half an hour before this point. So the provider will not allow the patient to sign a consent for the procedure because she's really not indicated that she understands the risks to her versus the benefits to the baby because it was very confusing. 45 minutes of discussion ensues with the interpreter frequently continuing to ask for clarification. Oh, enough, Professor Mulcahy. Just tell us what happened. Can't take it anymore. Story's giving me anxiety. Okay, fine. Patient eventually indicated that she wanted the cesarean. She signed the consent. Back we went as fast as we possibly could. Baby was born, APGARS 8-9. No clinical signs of the disorder in the arrhythmia did, as many do, resolve. He was fine. He breastfed like a champ. He stayed in the mom's room and really was cared for like any other baby born without any thing. They did in what's called an SNP microarray, which is a test on the actual newborn. They do take a segment of the cord and the placenta, like a chunk, like a one centimeter. So, you, you know, you have your cord, you take like a chunk of it. Um, and they took uh, cord blood, a sample of the umbilical cord blood to examine for normal cells, abnormal cells. And they were gonna have a, you know, pediatri a special pediatrician come in and look at the baby. Um, but I don't really have any further information because they were discharged because he was fine. Now, that might not have been the outcome. Maybe we would have had a baby with severe disabilities. But I kind of feel like this was a good place to get our heads together before the situation became so critical. All's well, it ends well, I guess. But maybe... She was on the high risk list. This could have been, okay, she's coming to deliver soon. We're gonna do an induction. Let's all have a huddle. That's sort of part of neonatal resuscitation protocol. Um, that before you anticipate, if you can anticipate a birth that might be problematic, you have a huddle. What did we do? What does this mean? Maybe that conversation at the bedside could have happened in an office visit with family members present. Maybe we could have done the teach back method where Maud had to tell us what she understood so we could fill in the gaps. Maybe she could have been referred to a support group for parents of children with mosaic trisomy 16. I'm going to um, actually pause this in a second, get to a website that I found after the fact um, that tells you just how variable this disorder can be. Maybe we could have had a birth plan sort of like an advanced directive with the mother's participation. I mean, when you have um, a disease that might be terminal or you do hospice care, your nurse sits down with you and makes sure that you go through all of the options. If this, then that. If I'm brain dead, I don't want this. But if resuscitation might give me meaningful quality of life, I do want it. 
maybe I want fluids or maybe I want um, food, but I don't want artificial feeding. We do that for our med surge patients. With OB patients, to be honest, birth plans usually give me superstitious willies um, because most of the people that make them, I feel like they maybe jinx themselves a little by having their heart set on a birth that may or may not be what we can give them. Um, so in a normal pregnancy, birth plans, you'll hear labor nurses have a superstition about it. Usually it's just an invitation for everything to go wrong. Not really, but in this case, a birth plan with an advanced directive. If my child has clear signs of a clinical disorder, I want or do not want resuscitation. I would rather have palliative care if it appears that my child has something lethal. If my child is in fetal distress, I do or do not want a C-section. <clears throat> something like that would have been so helpful. And I don't understand why nobody, I mean, by the time she got to me, this was going on for months. And it was sort of like, well, there's a note. There's a note. There's a note. She understood. It says she understood. She verbalized understanding. It meant nothing when the moment came to it. Um, so those are some professional issues. And why, you know, a little bit of knowledge could have been very dangerous. I mean, trisomy 16 mosaicism could look a lot of ways, I suppose. But brain damage from hypoxia, from fetal distress, that's forever. And we can prevent that. Um, whether we want to do that in a mother who has risk factors for complications um, of surgery, that would depend on that birth plan. And that should have been addressed in a more teachable moment with the patient's family present to help her sort of um, parcel that out for herself. So I'm sorry that this became such a long story, but it really shows um, how a little bit of knowledge of genomics could have been a really dangerous thing. Thank God in the end, it all worked out fine. Um, but this sort of underscores why we all need more education and we need to develop our professional role accordingly. So that's Maud. We are going to pick up with Travis and um, James, I'm sorry, James, in a minute. Just let me pause this video.